Welcome everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending <clears throat> on where you're joining us from today. We're pleased to be hosting today's session uh, focused on Kubernetes and specifically on the topic of continuous resource optimization and uh, hopefully uh, providing some uh, concepts and uh, reasoning and uh, ideas around uh, the topic of continuous optimization in Kubernetes environments. We, uh, as our customer base uh, adopts container strategies and Kubernetes in its various flavors, uh, you know, we're seeing a, a lot of interesting patterns emerge with respect to management challenges and uh, the ways our technology is used to help customers uh, with these challenges. Andrew Hillier is here, our CTO and co-founder. He is a uh, very entertaining speaker on technical topics and uh, hopefully the content today you'll find interesting and engaging. Uh, he usually does a wonderful job of both covering deep technical topics but keeping it light and um, uh, area enough that um, it's also entertaining. So Andrew, we will hand the floor over to you and um, get at the content. Thanks, Chuck, and thanks everyone for, for coming. I think you set the bar too high, Chuck. I was just hoping to be informative on this one. Not, <laughs> not entertaining. Um, so uh, I hope you find this interesting today. It, it's, as Chuck mentioned, we're trying to focus on the the problems, um, not theory. I'll talk a bit about theory and you know, kind of PowerPointy stuff, but I want to get at the actual problems that occur and, and the reasons why you really need to stay on top of these Kubernetes environments. And as Chuck said, um, we're learning a lot. I think our customers, are, everybody's learning a lot as we go, as we see these environments deploy and expand. And there's some things that are very interesting observations in the way they work, which, which people may not be aware of. You may be aware of these things, maybe not, we'll, we'll see. So we'll go through the three things. We're gonna try and keep it to 45 minutes. Um, Chuck and I were just talking before the call about how we love the 45 minute meeting uh, aspiration. Uh, we'll try and make it a reality, but leave time for, for questions. So please chime in, uh, even along the way, if you want, we, we've got, uh, I think we've got plenty of time for questions as well. So I'm gonna start with some hand wavy kind of theory on resource optimization. And this is coming from, again, what we're, we're seeing, you know, we, we, we've, we've seen, we're seeing a big shift, obviously in progression where everybody was virtual, obviously that's huge and people migrating to the cloud and then the containers. Um, and we're trying to really, you know, wrap our head around what's happening, you know, from a, from a technology perspective, but also from kind of an organizational perspective. And, you know, a, a good way to put it is that the, as you go to the right, the, the number of things that you're managing tends to shoot up. I mean, if you ever look at a cloud bill, it's pretty immense. Containers, containers are almost at the process level. Obviously, I'll talk a lot about this today. So there's many, many moving parts. And we're kind of shifting from a world where, in the virtual environments, we'd focus on where to put VMs, how to allocate resources, and a lot of planning activity, like when do I buy new servers? <clears throat> you know, where do I put new workloads that are coming down the pipe? Um, and we saw that, you know, that, that progressed very nicely in the virtual environments. Cloud is a bit different um, because now you're buying usually a la carte infrastructure as a service, and it's not so much around long-term planning <clears throat> and more around, you know, how do I make use of the offerings of the provider? How do I make it elastic? I'll, I'll talk about this because that's extremely important for containers. And, and, and what we call micro-purchasing, where the, the acquiring of resources has been decentralized. A, a junior engineer can put a line of code in a Terraform file that buys something. Um, and that's very different than the on-prem environment where you kind of lease or buy servers on, on a periodic basis. So it really decentralizes things. And then containers take that even further, <clears throat> excuse me, because they're just so granular. Um, you know, there's, there's many more of them. You have to give resource specifications of these things and they're organized in all kinds of weird and wonderful ways. They're pods and replica sets and deployments and they run on nodes, which could be cloud instances or VMs. So it kind of compounds this problem. Um, so again, that's why, you know, the, the complexity arrow kind of shoots up there as you get to the right. And the problem is, um, or a problem is that, uh, Along with the, the virtual environment you know, maturing, we saw the capacity management processes also mature. We, we, most of our customers have very mature and effective teams that are, are very good at you know, making sure you have enough on the floor without having too much. Um, but in the transition to cloud, and this can be different in different organizations, we find that um, a lot of times 
there's a completely new team stood up that's focusing on the cloud and and the capacity management team isn't necessarily involved the, the cloud focus initially at least tends to be more on the bill so they tend to go after uh, teams and products that make sense of this really detailed bill and maybe buying some reserved instances or savings plans but kind of dropping the ball on the capacity equation and, and we think that really needs to come back and we're seeing that happen in our customers but in kind of a different form um, it may be the same team it may be a different team um, you don't need to do the long-term planning stuff necessarily, but you still need to stay on top of the resources. And so we're using the phrase capacity operations or cap ops to describe this, uh, just because it's a really nice way to, simple way to describe the, the shift in the capacity equation from kind of an offline discipline that has a heavy planning element to an online dynamic continuous discipline. And, and, and that's part of the theme of this webcast is this continuous optimization. Um, and ultimately, we think this needs to happen because there needs to be automation. You can't, you can't survive doing this stuff manually as you get far to the right. If you have tens of thousands of containers, no human wants to look at that. We've seen customers with typos in their Terraform files because people are trying to figure out uh, how to set these things up. And we need to hand the keys over to the machine. So I'll be talking uh, more and more about that and, and specifically why in container environments this absolutely has to happen. But don't take our word for it. The FinOps Foundation also uh, does a lot of interesting surveys. And one of the ones that they found was that it's time for automation. Um, they're seeing not a lot of automation out there. Um, maybe notifications at second bar. Maybe there's automated ways of distributing information. But the, the, the fourth one down, the purple one, um, which is extremely important for containers, as I'll discuss, is, is very early days. So I think this, is, this needs to happen. I think there's some steps that need to happen to get us there. Um, but again, it's not just what we're seeing. I think it's um, kind of indisputable in the industry. Now let's look at this from a different angle and more from the, 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 um, the business problem that all this creates. And it's typically a cost problem. So I'm gonna talk a lot about technology, but a lot of times somebody might just see their problem as my, my cloud bill is too high. Um, and I'll kind of circle back to this several times. And when we look at the cloud bill um, and, and the cost in general, there's kind of two elements of it. There's one that, that can be solved by looking at you know how I'm buying, how I'm procuring, and there's a deeper section where we think the bigger savings are is the what I'm buying. So not just how I'm buying, but the resources I'm actually using. And so you know there's been an evolution in the in the cloud management market where there are a lot of um, products out there that that focus on the bill and on finding anomalies in the bill and maybe ultimately buying RIs or savings plans. And that can that, you know that's really useful because that can be done by someone who has a more of a finance uh, oriented point of view, um, without talking to the application teams themselves or getting your hands dirty with the apps. But but if you want to go below that line, you have to start to do that. You have to actually start looking at the actual resources that are in use, what how they size, what families am I buying? Am I buying memory optimized or burstable instances? The the containers, which of course is the topic today. How are my containers doing? Um, going back and being able to actually change things that are running. So the whole the idea of executing changes in the environment to, to optimize things is an interesting topic. Um, and ultimately maybe doing it through the DevOps pipeline. Now we're in the realm of the engineers and the app owners um, where you need to actually kind of, again, get inside the things to, to make it different. We think it's the, the, and our data shows it's the biggest difference that you can make, but it's fundamentally different than just reading the bill. And the, the, the challenge, that kind of gap I showed on the first slide when viewed in this lens is that we're seeing a lot of, um, if you're not using a capacity management team uh, or maybe they're, they're still focused on on-prem, we start to see uh, FinOps teams uh, uh, emerge where you know, focus on cloud financial management, a little bit more of a, a holistic view that's taking into account kind of an asset management sort of angle, but also the, the operational aspects of the cloud. But in practice, we find those groups still don't really cross this line. Um, they're either not big enough or they're too busy or they don't have the subject matter experts to really break through that barrier and say, I'm going to go and actually change what's running. And there's a FinOps Foundation survey showing that as well, that one of the biggest challenges is, is actually making changes to the environment, like the bottom half of this diagram. On the other end of the spectrum, we have DevOps out there, and their mandate is to deliver apps at a high velocity. And these teams are and should be focused on functionality. Um, somebody's pounding their fist saying, let's get that new feature out as fast as possible. That team should be focused on that not the granular resource specifications of every container. So we're finding this, this area is sitting in this bit of a gap right now between these different disciplines. Um, it's not really being done by the FinOps teams in our, in our observation. Um, arguably, maybe this should fall under FinOps, maybe it should fall under DevOps. They certainly have the Terraform and things to make changes, but 
it's not necessarily happening. And, and, and so that's, again, where we kind of place this cap ops. Some of our customers call it capacity 2.0, the next generation, more operationalized version of capacity that actually goes in and fixes things that are running, not, not just deploying new things and not just looking at the bill, but actually looking at the resources that are deployed. So these are just our observations. Um, but what I'm going to do is turn it over to you folks on the call, and we're going to do a bit of a poll on this front to see what you're seeing, who is responsible for this in your organization. And the, um, the possible options are the capacity team, the same people that have been doing it in the virtual environments, FinOps, DevOps, uh, somebody else, nobody. We didn't put an I don't know. The I don't know could be a good answer here because <laughs> people don't, a lot of teams, they don't know. Um, so we'll just let that kind of fill in. Um, there's no wrong answer here. I, I, I think part of it is how things evolved. If, if for example, you're running containers on-prem, um, then containers will probably still be under the same capacity team. If you're running them in the cloud, you know, AKS or EKS or something, it might've taken a different path entirely. So, <clears throat> Andrew, I will remind people, uh, actually not remind, uh, inform people that you can enter questions in the Q&A if you like. We will post questions at the end, um, or I may interrupt depending on, on the question, but yep. feel free if people have uh, questions or comments that the, uh, the Q&A function is enabled. Yep, yeah, feel, feel free. And that way, if we run the full hour, then I can blame you on the call, not, not me. All right, looks like we're done. And okay, this is interesting. So, so we do have some capacity, uh, the vast majority DevOps, and that's that's good. And that makes a lot of sense because that they're the ones deploying the app, so they're the ones that actually control the size. Uh, so then it turns the question is, are they getting it right or not um, as they deploy these things? So um, there are going to be values going out. Um, another team, I'd be, I'd love to hear what the other teams are. Um, and if somebody else has coined another phrase with the word ops on the end, I'd love to hear it because there's an awful lot of them right now. Um, and nobody. Yeah, that's that's uh, so that's interesting. Thanks for the thanks for the feedback on that. And I'll try and circle back to these things uh, as we continue. All right, let's continue on um, and get into the the meat of the um, the the container challenge and then the the three areas. So I'm just going to pull this slide up quickly. I'm not going to go through it. I think everybody in the call probably understands containers, uh, um, but they're complicated. So across the bottom, we have all the infrastructure, the nodes, they can be VMs, they can be scale groups in the cloud, they can be mainframes for that matter. Um, at the top, we have all the, the demand, the containers and the pods and all the structures we were talking about and all their weird and wonderful incarnations. And then there's also a bunch of structures that link these things like, like projects and namespaces and quotas. And I'll talk a bit about them. That's probably a whole topic unto itself. Um, but these things are all very important. And to the theme of the webcast, you really need to stay on top of this. All this is constantly changing, let alone growing, even a steady state environment is constantly changing. Um, and you know, we see a bunch of, of higher level challenges in this. It's, it's really hard to just know what's going on. I mean, it, just to, to, if you pull up a Grafana chart for a container um, and you have 10,000 containers, you're not really gonna get a picture of what's going on. Um, there, there's, there's a big gap there in terms of the visibility, but also more specifically to the topic today, um, it's really difficult to figure out what, you know, what resource to give these structures. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in some detail. And because of that, it's also really difficult to figure out what the, this, the nodes should be because they're, they're highly interrelated. So um, I'll talk about both these things and how they connect. And then of course, there's the whole purchasing side that if I wanna go and prepay, what am I prepaying for? It could be the wrong stuff. If I'm using the wrong stuff, then how do I double down on it financially? And we see that being a big problem as well is that you can get a, very gratifying financial savings by prepaying, you just might be prepaying for the wrong stuff. Or you might lock yourself in and then if your workloads go down, you're stuck paying and there's all kinds of other challenges with that. So continuous optimization is, is what we are uh, uh, talking about. Let me just try and move my, uh, my zoom bar here so I can uh, obstruct the slide. So um, Unlike many webcasts where we advertise three things and we just talk for a lot of time, there are actually three things we're going to discuss. They're, they're, they're real, um, they're pretty substantial. And the first one I want to cover is that, and it, this, I'll take a minute to explain this so it really sinks in. The container requests and limits, the values you give to containers aren't virtual resources. They're real resources. And, and, and that's kind of profound and I'll explain why it is, but 
let me kind of explain it from a uh, uh, pictorial perspective. Um, let's just say I'm, I'm, I'm picking on Kubernetes here and I've got a bunch of nodes, the orange boxes that are either instances in the cloud or scale group or virtual machines. Um, and I'm going to deploy containers and somebody needs to give these values, these requests and limit values. Um, and this is tricky. So I give memory requests, memory lim limits, CPU requests, CPU limits. And what happens is that will cause my, you know, that declarative code will cause my containers to spin up or my pods to spin up. And in, in this symbolic world, the power, the, the, the Tetris block is kind of like the workload. It might have a different pattern. Um, and the dotted line is the request values because I'm going to earmark resources for those uh, those uh, pods or, or containers. And that dotted line is extremely important. And, and the reason why is because that's how Kubernetes figures out where to put these things and how much it puts on each node. So let me just, you know, and, and before I go off the next slide, um, at the end, we'll give a link to the previous webcast, which was similar up to now, very similar content. but at about this point, I went into a lot of details on why it's so hard to choose those numbers. So if you're interested in the, the kind of the, the thought process for choosing requests and limits, and we did a bit of an analysis on that. So we'll provide a link to the previous webcast if you didn't attend. Um, but I'm not going to get into that today. It's, 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 it's hard to figure out what those values are. I'm just going to talk about what happens if they're, if they're wrong. So to do that, I'm going to go to, to a Kubernetes uh, web page saying how pods with resource requests are scheduled. And I won't make you read this. This is a, a full service webcast, so I will read it to you. Um, the schedule ensures that for each resource type, the sum of the resource requests of the scheduled containers is less than the capacity of the node. Note that although actual memory CPU resource usage of nodes is very low, the scheduler still refuses to place a pod on a node if the capacity check fails. Now, I want to contrast this to if you went into a VMware web page, it would look very different. It would say the scheduler ensures that it puts things on the nodes up to eight times the amount of resources that the that the host has, not the amount. So because there's overcommit, there are virtual resources. I can give the same CPUs to different consumers. Containers don't do that. And I don't think a lot of people realize that they don't do that because because Kubernetes does talk about overcommit. They use that word, but it's more about the difference between the request and the limit. It's not overcommit in the same way that a virtual environment might have. Um, the request values themselves are not overcommitted. They're more like a resource reservation. You you get that. So if I give you a thousand millicores, you get a thousand millicores and it's yours and nobody else can have that. The scheduler will move on to a new node uh, and, and before it, it, it eats into your millicores. So I want to stress that point. Uh, it, and, 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 you know, it, it's, I don't think everybody fully realizes that that's how it works. So when you actually run these things, um, you know, what, this is an actual example and, and we've analyzed many environments and they all kind of look like this. It's kind of unusual how much they all look like this. So this is a, a Kubernetes cluster, and this is the request values that are allocated out to the running pods. So and, and deployments and replica sets. So 80 to 90 percent of the resources of the cluster are allocated to the containers, but in this case, on average, about seven and a half percent of those resources were being used. So this is this is very profound, and it's uncanny how much we see seven to eight percent utilization. It's kind of where it seems to fall. And again, it's almost every environment, I say almost every environment we looked at looks like this. And um, again, it's a very low utilization. So this is the point where somebody says, wow, containers are expensive because they see an Amazon bill with a whole ton of nodes running. And they're saying, why am I running so many nodes? Well, it's because you're giving out all the resources to the containers um, and Kubernetes is forced to run more and more nodes to, to meet the demand. And again, it's because these aren't virtual CPUs. If this were a virtual environment, I would give the same one lap team the two CPUs and another one two CPUs, and they're all getting the same two CPUs. And everybody kind of got used to that over a decade or so. You know, everybody adjusted to sharing, and now everybody shares. But that's not the way these things work. And I think people assume they do, or that there's some magic happening here that Kubernetes will automatically make everything work together. Nope, Kubernetes just doles out the resources you ask for, and it ends up stranding a ton of capacity, creating very low utilization. Um, Again, if anybody wants to see this in their environment, it, it, it's, it's very eye-opening to run the analytics and look at this, these numbers. Um, and then again, that ultimately typically turns into, wow, is that ever expensive? But it's not really a cost. It's a cost problem, but it's not really a financial problem. The problem is actually a technical problem underneath. So um, to fix this, of course, this needs to be fixed and, 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 you know, and continuously fix this. This is what an analysis would look like of a container environment. 
um, with a bunch of pods and deployments. And if we look at you know this top row up here, we got 24 of these things running, and we're saying they're the wrong size. And and again, there's a there's requests and limits for CPU and memory. And I'm not going to go through all these things, but if I just zoom in on the analysis, you know, if you look at all the workload patterns and you run machine learning to understand what the container actually does, this one um, looks like it is a 24-hour review. Uh, where we see the peak and the minimum and then the quartiles in there. So we kind of see the sustained activity. And, and this, this, um, this particular deployment in this case is um, running you know, at around 1,000 millicores, peaking up to three until about noon. And then it goes into a higher utilization kind of mode for four hours and then comes back down a bit. Um, so it's just a kind of a, a workload pattern. There's, you see all kinds of different patterns. But the problem here is that the request and limit values are those two lines. The, the yellowish line is the request and the purple is the limit. They're set to the same value. So even in Kubernetes terms, we're not over committing here. Um, but what we're doing is guaranteeing this thing 4,000 millicores, so four CPUs. And we're also not letting it use more than four CPUs. So in this case, the recommendation is kind of conservatively saying, let's bring the request down and the limit up. And this thing's going to work better. And it's going to play nicer in the overall sandbox that everybody's stuck in because you're not hogging all those resources. Now, this is all policy controlled. You can get more aggressive and bring that down even more because you're still not going to go to re super high utilization by doing this, uh, but you can progressively get, it's not hard to double the utilization of one of these environments um, by adjusting these numbers. Because again, that yellow line is the thing that is uh, we're giving out and then this workload owns those resources. It, does, it doesn't share them. So um, I, it's a really important lens to view this problem through because Again, I think where it comes back is as a cost problem in a cloud bill somewhere. And, and it may take a bit of time to un unravel what the actual cause of that cost is. It's those numbers in the, in the uh, Terraform or the, the Helm files. So um, that was number one. The, the, the resources are, aren't virtual. They're actually physical or, or actual resources, I'll call them. Now, so that, that kind of, the, what I've kind of talked about now creates a kind of a, a, a straining problem where I'm running too much. I end up having too much capacity on the floor. Um, probably more scary is the reverse. And we see an awful lot of this too, is that if you don't make these numbers high enough, you can get killed. Um, CPU, if you don't make it high enough, you get throttled because CPU is kind of an elastic, I believe is what they call it, resource. So you'll just get deprioritized. But the memory limits, um, the memory requests, are, are different. Uh, so if I say that I'm requesting 64 megabytes, let's kind of drill into one of these nodes at the bottom here, one of these orange squares and talk about exactly what happens when I do that. So to do that, let's take a hypothetical memory usage curve that um, is kind of low and then goes high late in the day. Now, many of you on the call will probably look at that and say, that's not really a memory curve because memory is never zero. And yes, you're right. It's just a symbolic curve. Uh, the fastest one I could find because I just wanted to represent a model where what if I have memory that's kind of low and then gets high at the late in the day. So let's just talk about it in a Tetris terms, which is kind of symbolic. So um, memory chugs along, say at you know a thousand uh, megabytes, and then goes up to two thousand at eight pm or something like that. So that's why we use these Tetris blocks. It's kind of a good proxy for a workload pattern. So let's say I want to put this on a node, but I don't give it a request that that is high enough to capture that peak. Um, I just give it a lower request uh, and hope everything works out okay. Now, this can get very complicated. It might work out okay because it might be nobody else is using memory at that time and I'm allowed to use memory up to my limit. But um, from a Kubernetes perspective, it doesn't know that that thing's getting busy at 8 p.m. It doesn't, it doesn't do predictive modeling uh, look ahead. That's what we do is kind of do the predictive analysis of the workload patterns. Um, it's just going to say, okay, you asked for 1,000 millicores. I still see plenty of space on this box. I'm going to keep running more and more of these. So if you, know, you have this scenario where more than one workload gets busy at 8 p.m., all of a sudden you've got resource contention. And that resource contention isn't just kind of, I'm gonna slow you down. If it's memory, it's I'm going to kill you. It's called the out of memory killer. It's, a, it's actually not a feature of Kubernetes. It's a Linux kernel feature that will just kill things if you're running out of memory. Um, and it's pretty indiscriminate. So um, that is the nightmare scenario that if you get these values wrong on the low side, so this is why probably everybody sets them nice and high, <laughs> which creates a massive cost problem, because if I set them too low, I get killed. Um, and so, you know, if I go to another web page, this time I'm going to pick on OpenShift, which is Kubernetes. I just like this one because it kind of explains this particular dynamic pretty well. Again, I will read it to you. 
Um, on the memory request, if a node's memory is exhausted, like the whole node, OpenShift, uh, in this case, they're product dedicated, prioritizes evicting its containers whose memory usage most exceeds the memory request. So not only will you get evicted, um, which means being killed, there's no vmotion in containers, you're just going to get killed. It's a nicer word for it. Um, then it'll choose the ones that most egregiously go over their limit. So there's a, there's a, you know, it's like horseshoes. Close does count here. <laughs> You're better off if you're close. Um, and the memory limit is also very important because if you go above your memory limit, in this case, it's describing that if all the processes inside the container or any you know, go above your memory limit, the uh, memory killer will select and kill a process in the container, which is particularly scary. Like, I don't even know what that looks like. If you're running an app and you just lose some piece of a, a container, not even the whole thing, you might not even know you lost it. So this is why the, what I was talking about in the first problem manifests itself as a cost problem. This manifests itself as a stability problem. If people say, ooh, I have a stability problem in my container environment. Well, this is you know, a pretty plausible explanation for a stability problem, especially if I'm killing stuff inside a container. Like I, again, I don't even know if people, if you're, if you're Splunk or whatever you're using is gonna catch that happening in any, in any reasonable way. You might just start limping along without a piece of your container running. Um, so we need to fix this as well. Uh, we need to do it continuously. Again, this is not set and forget. I can't just get it right and then run for a month. I need to constantly watch this stuff because things constantly change. Um, and this is another container analysis. Uh, I think it's a different one. Uh, anyway, it's a different one highlighted for sure. We're, we're looking at an upsize now. Um, and I won't go through all those numbers, but I just want to zoom in on the memory curves. CPU and memory are both too small in this example. But in this example, on the memory curve, the current settings, we're asking for a, about a gigabyte, a thousand megabytes of memory is being requested, which is clearly below utilization. We're using it three times that much. And the limit is sitting right around 3000, which is pretty much what I'm using. So we're at risk here already of just, if we use a little bit more memory, uh, something's gonna go horribly wrong here, just, just in this situation. But looking at the yellow curve as well, is back to my Tetris blocks. And it's not even a time of day thing. I don't need to wait till 8 p.m. If I run a lot of containers like this, where the request value is lower than the memory usage, I'm, I'm likely going to have some problems. So we're recommending bring both those numbers up. In this case, we're kind of recommending to be very close to each other because it's a very flat workload. There's not like there's a lot of peaks and valleys. Um, and it's going to be a lot safer. So um, you know, there's the cost side and there's the risk side or the fear side. And this is very real. We analyze environments where Almost the entire environment is under spec for memory. We, we see customers, for example, taking a component like a web server or a Redis cache or something like that, and just giving them all the same value, giving them all 100 millicores or 100 megabytes, um, where in actuality, a lot of times the CPU needs to be less and the memory needs to be more. It's, it's kind of a common pattern we see. So you're in this lose-lose situation of high risk and high cost. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's not that containers are expensive. People say, ooh, containers are expensive. No, they're, they're not, they're just what they are. It's like saying a, a Unix process is expensive. It, it's, it is what it is. It's how you use them and how they all run that can be very expensive or unstable. And, and again, these instability problems can be extremely hard to trace because um, you may not even know this kind of stuff's happening. So that's the, the container ups and downs. Um, let's talk about the scale groups under the containers for a minute. I think we're doing good on, on time. And again, feel free to ask any questions if you have them. Now let's talk about the, the the scale groups, and you know people view scale groups as these nice elastic components, which they are, which get bigger and smaller as your loads change. So um, I personally, I think ASTs are or the equivalent scale sets and, and these things in other clouds. I'm talking Amazon terminology here, um, are are very very important for elasticity. I think everything should run in a scale group because they automatically get bigger and smaller with your loads if used properly. Um, rather than just making a lot of instances that are kind of islands of, of stranded capacity. But people also assume there's magic here that these things are just going to flex based on the container usage. And it doesn't really work that way. And to, to discuss this, I'm going to kind of go back to a bit of theory here and talk about a Venn diagram for a second. There's really multiple things happening here. We've got the containers and their resources, and then we have the nodes and their resources and their scaling. And I'm just going to talk in cloud terms. This can all be on-prem as well. But let's just say I have a scale group, an auto scale group. Um, what's it doing? And is it aligned with the red circle? And then there's a green circle, which is the cost side. And, and these are all highly interrelated. I'm not talking a lot about cost today. And again, a lot of, a lot of customers have tools that look at the bill and understand the bill, and that's great. 
Um, but what I really need to do is from a container perspective to look at these things, I need to be enlightened by all of these things for the decisions I make because they're, they're very interrelated. So if my containers are all wrong, my nodes are gonna be all wrong. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute, um, but they're, they're highly related. If my nodes are all wrong, then my RIs are gonna be all wrong. Um, I'm, or I'm going to mispurchase at some point. I'm going to buy too much or too little or the wrong thing. And if I don't understand this overlap, then I can't really understand what costs what in a container context. Uh, you know, I've got quotas, I've got namespaces, I've got all these things. Um, what are they costing? When someone runs, what, what does it cost? Well, who knows? Because, you know, if you don't know the real cost, you don't know how to map it through the nodes to the red circle. Um, you're not going to be able to figure it out. So we like to think that the intersection point of this is really where it's at for container optimization. You need to be enlightened by all of these three things. Um, and you know, the, the green circle might be optimized by a different group, or it might be a FinOps or a, a, some other team. But it need, the, the analysis of containers needs to be aware of what's going on there. And for the purposes of this discussion, I want to focus on this little intersection point. Um, because I mentioned earlier, if the containers have the wrong values, then the nodes will be wrong, but the nodes need to deliver those request values, um, whether they're being used or not. If you say, you know, a, a team needs, you know, they've allocated 100 containers with 1,000 millicores each, I need to have 100 CPUs running uh, for what they've asked for. I can't start them when they need them. They, they will be running because that's just the way I need enough nodes to schedule those. Back to that, that, that web page I showed, that the, the resources have to be there. Um, and so to kind of put that back in, in, in these terms, um, you know, what that means is it means a couple of things. So um, we see cases where the nodes are all pinned. So it doesn't matter if those Tetris blocks at the bottom get bigger or smaller throughout the day, you have the same number of nodes. Overnight, if, if the container is still running, it doesn't matter if it's idle, you have the same number of nodes. So a lot of people look at their scale groups and say, you know, it's not flexing, it's not actually moving. Um, it's because it's got to deliver the request, whether they're being used or not. So those request values being wrong um, has a, a, an even bigger impact on elasticity. You're just going to be inelastic. Um, it's, just, it's not going to automatically flex. Um, if, you're no, if your pods turn off, then yes, you can flex. And that's, so if you have microservices or your application architecture runs and kills containers as part of the load, then you will see some elasticity. You'll still be bloated, but you will be elastic. Um, but again, a lot of times you see people looking at their environments and they're not elastic at all. Um, and you know, and that's and that's why. So <clears throat> it's all interrelated. If we take those container utilization metrics and we analyze them, like I showed earlier, we can optimize these numbers. It could be up, could be down. It's usually a mix. But if I <clears throat> if I make the dotted lines wrap those Tetris blocks better, if they more accurately reflect what the app actually needs, then we're way better off because Kubernetes will automatically then run more on each node. Kubernetes works fine. There's nothing wrong with Kubernetes. It just if you put garbage in, you get garbage out. So if you ask for a lot, it gives you a lot. If you ask for the right amount, it gives you the right amount and it can run fewer nodes. So we see immediately the numbers go down by optimizing these numbers. The, the scale groups can just flex in uh, automatically and they, need to, they can run at a lower minimum because um, everything just fits better on the nodes. Now, the other thing that scale groups don't do or instances in general don't do in the cloud is automatically conform to the workload. So now that I've done this, I might find that I'm using more memory than CPU. And so I might be able to say, well, my nodes, not only are they, can they scale down, but also they can be different types of nodes. I can go from a general purpose to a memory optimized node. I, I don't need as many CPUs as I have on the floor. Um, so not only does the, the, the scaling go down, the shape of the node can, can change to conform to the workload. And again, this needs to happen continuously because as my workloads change or as my, as my containers come and go or as I change them and optimize them, the nodes need to go along in lockstep because that's what the bill has in it. The bill is going to have M4 extra larges. It's going to have a ton of them. And instead, I can have fewer R4 larges, smaller instances. And you know, that shift, you know, I just recently analyzed a customer where that shift to memory optimized plus a decrease in the scaling was well over half the cost just gone just like that by, by doing that. So the, the scale groups don't magically do this. They, they, they don't actually flex at all in a lot of container environments. Um, and we've seen you know, not only the, the, the request values, but things like cluster quotas, um, they can pin these things as well. So if you have a big cluster quota, you're just gonna run a bunch of nodes all the time, but it doesn't matter what they're doing. Um, so this can be very, very wasteful. 
And just to show what that analysis looks like, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, um, here's a, these, these rows in this table are all uh, auto scale groups in Amazon. Um, again, I won't go through all the details. We have a lot of different recommendations. We, we say you should make it newer or different, uh, smaller, bigger, or you should scale differently. And this one I'll pick on is running on compute optimized larges of the prior generation. And we're saying, and, and from four to eight nodes is what the scaling parameters are. And we're saying, put it on a memory optimized gen five and scale from two to seven. So you can have a lower min and, the, and, and a slightly lower max, but you're, but you're gonna get the same memory. And again, that probably makes a ton of difference on the bill and doesn't change the behavior of the apps at all. The, the app teams don't even need to know this because they don't really know what nodes they're running on. They're just running the containers. And you can see all kinds of analytics across the bottom there. And that's probably a topic for another webcast. We do a full simulation of the workload in the scale sets with different scenarios uh, to figure out which one is actually the optimal node type, size, and scaling parameters um, by replaying history and then machine learning to, to figure that out. So it's a pretty cool analysis. But the bottom line is these things are important because again, this is where the dollars come through. This is this, these rows in this table are what actually shows up on the bill and why somebody's going to say, wow, containers are expensive. Well, yes, if you're using them this way and the, your containers are all misconfigured, they are very expensive. So just to sum it up, um, you know, the containers, the red circle, there's a, there's, it's very important, the requests and limits, I think I've talked about that to death, that needs to be kind of mapped through the pods and deployments, because those are the manifested entities that have the Terraform or the Helm charts, where you can actually make a difference. Back to the earlier uh, survey, when people said DevOps is responsible for this, DevOps has the Terraform code, you just need to put some lines of code in it that reference the analytics to make this happen. So um, the request, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the clusters and namespaces, the, even initial values, is a huge win in just getting a smarter initial value for a new container by looking at the ones that are already running. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a low hanging fruit. Then, um, and with that, continuously looking at the nodes, uh, there should be more or fewer of them, should they be bigger or smaller, uh, should they be a different family or, or a newer family. Um, and of course, on the financial side, there's a whole bunch of things that go along with that. Like I said, this this um this could be done in in you know in our product or in different products. It, it might be a different team looking at the pure finance of it. But you know how much am I spending and what RI should I buy um, is kind of the third part of the equation. But certainly the red and blue circles need to account for the green in, in what they're doing so that you would get one a true optimization. For example, a lot of our customers have RIs. I don't want to optimize the nodes to be something that isn't covered by an RI. I'll go backwards. So. Um, the RI coverage is a is a key thing, and that you saw, those screenshots that I had earlier, you can see that as one of the columns. And back to that earlier side, understanding what on earth is going on across all this stuff in itself is high value. Um, and last slide is is just you know the, I'll I'll talk about the the topic continuous optimization. So I've talked about what needs to be optimized. Um, there's also the how, and so. If you have a well-informed answer that's kind of at the center of that Venn diagram that's accounting for all the things, so I'm not giving stupid answers, so I'm not putting your scale group on a type of node that doesn't have an RI, or I'm not downsizing containers that should be large because they're part of an HA pair, whatever the case is, I need to have a smart uh, answer, then the ideal way to do it is to actually map it through the DevOps tool chain. And so, you know, and I mentioned this, so rather than hard coding values, this is a Terraform example, um, which we see a lot of people doing. It's kind of ironic infrastructure as code, but you're hard coding. Um, you can just put lines of code in. You know, we have a Terraform module, for example, that just lets you insert that in, and the machine learning does it for you. And this is very high value because the app teams and the DevOps teams, they probably don't need to worry about these numbers. They, 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 if they can trust the machine learning, just figure it out. I, I've got too many of these things and not enough time. So that's what we call optimization as code. That slipstreams into the pipeline. Um, along with, this is very important, um, people who own those apps probably want to know that they're doing something that's safe. So they might have change management. You might need to open a ticket. You might need to at least log the change. Um, you might need, we have some customers that use Slack channels where an app team can subscribe to recommendations on their app. They might just want to know it before they approve it and understand what's happening. And when you get all that right, you get what we call CI CD CO and the CO is continuous optimization. Uh, so the tool chain just does all the work for us. It's kind of a new school automation where I'm just deploying from code, but the code has a line of code that knows what we should be deploying that's informed by machine learning. And so we think back to that first slide where we think automation is critical. 
we think this is what that automation looks like. We already see customers doing it. Um, this is, you know, one of our customers who's agreed that, you know, have a case study on our website where in their open shift environment, I'll just build all this out. Um, when they uh, build their Docker images, um, they hit our APIs, get the requests and limits, and through a bunch of terribly new school sounding products like Groovy, uh, they, they uh, uh, update the, the uh, OpenShift templates automatically on deploy. Um, again, there's a web, there's a, on a website, there's a little case study on that. And this is exactly what we think where everybody's gonna need to get for container. It's a little harder to do this for cloud. You probably need more approval, but a lot of times containers, I think these guys just got pre-approval. It just does it. Uh, um, and that's exactly where we think we need to be. The continuous optimization. These guys are a shining star example of that, where we think everybody needs to get. And I did almost use the 45 minutes. We'll do one more quick poll. And then um, uh, I think we still have time for questions or if anyone wants to hang around a few minutes longer, but last poll, how do you set the requests and limits? Um, and again, I think you can kind of read the answers that it's really either guesswork or not at all, or, or um, again, we see everybody using Grafana. I love Grafana. Uh, so looking at it, it's probably hard to do for 10,000 containers. Um, uh, and you probably have our time looking at enough history and, and really understanding the patterns. Um, automated analysis, <clears throat> um, you know, if any of our customers are on the call uh, that are they're using us, we expect a yes for that answer. Uh, and don't know is perfectly fine because uh, again, some people uh, are just kind of familiarizing themselves with containers and may not know the lay of the land um, in their organization. So what would that, that fill out, Chuck? Is there any other uh, parting comments? We're kind of getting close to the time. Yeah, so uh, thanks everyone for participating in the polls. Uh, if you have questions for Andrew or comments, uh, again, through the, uh, through the console, we welcome those. Um, as we wind up the poll here, uh, I think we have a, a slide on, uh, on some additional resources that uh, we can share. Uh, but Andrew, a question from the group on uh, what you're seeing with respect to native, uh, native Kubernetes versus managed services uh, for, for enterprises. What are you, what are you seeing? What, what are you finding? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, I think we, we do see a lot of open shift, both on-prem and in the cloud. I think, it, you know, we like it because it Prometheus is with it. It's kind of a little more polished bundle of things. Um, so it's easier to get data from, and it's more of a known quantity. Um, so in that sense, I do think so a lot of our larger enterprise customers are using that. And, and in the cloud, ECS, we see a lot of ECS, although it's not Kubernetes. People start using it early, and it works very well. EKS, AKS, we, we, we see those very popular. So I don't know. We see a lot of people rolling their own, certainly in the cloud, people are just turning on the services. Uh, again, EKS, AKS, GKE, uh, uh, very popular. Um, OpenShift being the other one. So I, I do think people are kind of opting for the, the, the more polished service around it. It just makes sense. You know, you get better information through CloudWatch if you're using the you know, ECS gives it better data than, than trying to do it yourself. So um, yeah, I think that's a trend that we're seeing and that and it just makes a lot of sense. It's just, I think people want to get away from the science projects and just kind of make it work. Uh, related question, is there anything in those managed uh, services that makes the resource management any different or easier or? Um... It, it's, you know, I, I don't want to disparage the providers, but a lot of a lot of what I described goes way beyond what you might get out of. So, you know, there are some services that might give basic recommendations for like a cloud instance being wrong, but they're not based on a deep policy and deep machine learning to give you a really precise answer to take the action. So one of the problems we see is that you can't automate something unless it's absolutely correct. So there are some basic services, but they don't go deep that deep. They don't go like the scale group stuff I go, you're not gonna find, you know, detailed uh, uh, simulations of scale group patterns necessarily and linking it to the containers. So again, Kubernetes has DPA, HPA, things like that. Um, you know, they, they're, they're fairly basic. Um, and so what we find is that there are native tools out there, but they to really do this you need to be absolutely correct. And to do that, you need some pretty serious analytics. So, um, you know, I don't want to disparage any native tools or cloud providers, but we find is that, you know, a lot of our customers look at those things, but they, um, you know, we did a comparison against one of the native providers uh, uh, recently for a customer in Azure. And in an environment of, you know, thousands of systems, we were giving, you know, 2,500 recommendations, it was giving 100. 
as your advisor was. It just wasn't. But that that would probably be at, at the node or or the cloud instance level versus yep. the, you know peering into the container infrastructure, right? Right. That, yeah. So yeah. The, yeah, into the container infrastructure, and, and none of the cloud providers I don't think provide anything really in that front in the, in the, on the peering into the containers in any detail. So. Surprisingly, they're not really worried about how much you're using, right? <laughs> yeah, if you're if you're buying five times more infrastructure than you need, I'm not sure they're going to be too much of a hurry to fix it. Uh, that's not true. I mean, uh, we do find we, we partner with the cloud providers, and they they do worry about people being efficient. But sure, probably, sure, uh, but, yeah, uh, agreed. Um, maybe you could Andrew pop to the next slide just so that people can see the follow-up okay. information. And just to read out just this question in, in 10 seconds, you know, this makes a lot of sense. Grafana, again, you can do it, probably start to do in scale and and you know you're using visuals, not a, a policy, and then some automation, some guesswork. It's it's um uh yeah, all over the board. And the last slide. So uh, an invite here and the QR codes just make it uh, faster to find these uh, on our website, but I call your attention to uh, a new white paper by Andrew uh, on the notion of capacity operations or cap ops and uh, the importance of it. And it covers a lot of the themes that we, we discussed today, as well as um, uh, the prior webcast, which is also available for replay uh, on, on our website. Um, always welcome to reach to us for, uh, you know, specific conversations about your own needs um, and the contact form on our website is great for that. Uh, we do have a question on uh, the pricing model for, uh, for Densify and uh, the way we price is in an annual subscription because we are a SaaS product and um, we base the uh, pricing on the, the basically the size or scale of the environment. So the number of containers uh, that you are or the number of instances uh, in the cloud that you're running and the larger the number, the lower the price on that annual basis. And if you are interested in ballpark pricing, or estimates, those sorts of things. Again, the contact form on our website is a great way to do that. We generally have a short discovery call with you, ask a few questions, and uh, are able to very quickly tell you uh, how you would enable some of the capabilities that Andrew talked about today. So um, thank you all for your, uh, your interactions, questions, and participation. There's clearly a, a uh, popular topic based on, on the number of attendees we had today. Uh, watch for uh, email on replay and of the recording, uh, as well as uh, our next webcast, uh, which is on the uh, events section of our website. Andrew, thanks for your time today. Thanks for the presentation and uh, have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks, everyone.